We should just like start it. Started like three seconds ago. Let's just go. Let's continue on. Everyone should know this was this was streamed live. Yeah. On johnset.goo.who.u slash YouTube with dot live. So I think yes. Ben, the best way to start is without context, and so therefore let us now start with Rust one seventy four point zero. Let's do it. In 174.0, we got lint configuration through cargo. And now I have to ask you, is this something that you have seen and are excited by? Yes, actually. So I think it's pretty cool. It's pretty common when you open a crate root file and you see, like, I don't know about common, but like in some cases, some crates are like very just about like, you know, meticulous about like having every single lint that they allow or deny uh, in their crate root. It's kind of just noise. It feels like, right, it's not, theoretically, you'd like for... Let's just back up, right? One of the cool things about Rust is that if you say you're you know, compiling in like GCC, like I see code, right? You need, you, know, you need to remember to pass, you know, dash, dash warn, dash w all, dash w whatever um, for your warnings. And in Rust, um, because, you know, command invocations are kind of like nebulous and hard to, you know, codify, um, putting that somewhere in your source code is nice. That's an improvement, right? Um, where I can say, hey, like, you know, when I, the author of this code, built this, I, you know, you know, I think it should be clean with these warnings. And so I don't need to worry about my users compiling like this or, you know, a contributor fretting to, you know, like, oh, do this thing that I'm warning about. It's there in the source code. And so let's 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 roll than a command invocation, a CLI uh, with the compiler. Um, but it is kind of like a little bit noisy where you just have it like here because you'd like, in theory, for your source code to only contain things that like affect like actually how it gets built and not just like a warning output. Um, and so I can totally see where people don't want to have this in their source file in the crate root. And so having it in the cargo file is a good alternative. Like it's not going away the ability to do it in the source file. If you want to do it there, you can. But uh, it, I, I do like the idea of putting it here. And also because with workspaces, it means that you can share these lints across the entire workspace really easily. And so that's cool, I think. Yeah, I agree. I, I think there's some debate about whether you know, this isn't really about how I build my crate. It's about the style of the crate. And that uh, mm -hmm. I think there was some debate about, you know, should this really be a part of cargo as opposed to Rust C, right? So, you know, the cargo Tomo thing is entirely a cargo construct, but lints are a Rust C construct. And so by putting in the cargo, this now means that if the project was built by something that's not cargo, it might no longer build because the source code triggers a, you know, let's say a deny by default lint that the cargo Tomel allows. So I think that was some of the discussion, some of the reason why it's taken us as long to actually get it. Well, if you're, I, I assume that if you have the lint, like, you know, if you have a deny in your crate root and you have the allow in cargo, the crate root deny will override. That's what I assume. I haven't that's checked probably this, true. I think that's how I'd reasonably yeah, that's probably assume true. it. But so, again, again, the source code, you know, is ultimately the source of truth. Uh, and honestly, you'd probably hope there would be a warning if you had both, you know, the lint level like, you know, enabled and maybe we've not, maybe, maybe it's fine to have like a general default over here and then a fine grain deny over here. Maybe it's a totally reasonable I, thing to have. I think it's actually more about if you don't have anything in your source, but you have a, an explicit allow of a deny rule in your cargo Tomel lints table, mm -hmm. because that way, if you compiled it with some other tool, like let's say you compiled it with Bazel that does invoke Rust C, it would no longer build, but it would build with cargo because cargo knows to look at the cargo tomol and sees that that lint should be allowed based on the right. cargo tomol lint. That, that is only a problem if there is a deny by default lint in Rusty that you are allowing. And so if it's a, yep. it's a, it's a lint in Clippy, it's not a big deal. It's not a problem. Yep. Right? If it's like, you know, uh, an allowed lint or a worn lint or anything else, that's not going to be a problem. And generally, deny by default lints in Rust C are very severe. Yeah. Um, like, so there are a few in our previous one, 171, they added the new clipper lint, so it was kind of like, oh, you're doing a thing that is immediate undefined behavior. That's just wrong. We're just, just going to make that an error. Um, and so uh, you can override it. I'm not sure if there's really any reason to ever want to. Um, and again, there there is an even stronger ability in Rust C. Above deny, there is a compiler blend thing called forbid and a forbid lint can't be overridden it's just an error effectively you just can't over you know override it uh and so you could say hey like you know if we think it's going to be immediate immediately why isn't it just forbid maybe it should be forbid um but i think it's kind of just being conservative and like maybe yeah. somebody somewhere has a reason to to allow this and in the future some things my art and i might become forbid just to make things easier for it to maintain and it's nice to have them as compiler errors as opposed to having them as lint passes right um so i don't know uh it is it, i think it's a very specific use case where you'd have to worry about oh i'm building it with basil now and it stops building uh but even if you did the error message is pretty self-evident where it's kind of like oh it's not wondering what went wrong it's oh you now have this deny lint and the reason it's not building now i'm not building might be a problem like oh they had the lint configured in the cargo tunnel 
okay, that's a reasonable thing to have, but it's still like a pretty niche. I don't think it's really a big thing to worry about. Yeah, uh, I think that's again, right. Yeah, it's a little bit, there's a separation of concerns question here. No, I, but I think that's right. And I, I think that's also why, you know, ultimately this did go through and this is why we got it in, in Rust 174, right? Is because ultimately there weren't enough serious concerns to make us not do it. Right. Like mm -hmm. uh, th this being an example of something where realistically, you know, if, if you did run into a use case like this, what you should probably do is allow the lint in your source file instead of in your cargo toml for that particular case. Yeah. And so, yeah, I don't know. I think it's a, it's a reasonable thing. It's like it is important to make sure that, like, you know, projects remain Rust projects and not cargo projects left much of the time. Right. Um, the whole point is that cargo is not tightly tied to language where cargo still has to use the Rust sequence interface CLI. It doesn't get any kind of like blessed thing it still has to pass all of its values through environment variables and command line flags and you can always tell cargo hey like i think i forget what the option is but if you're like running cargo there's there is a command line flag for a cargo that says hey don't actually invoke rust c just print out what you would invoke and you can run it yourself yep point, no it's right? totally true um, and so that's a it's like it's a cool thing that it's still it, it, it decouples cargo from rusty and allows things like basil or if you're doing some weird thing that you can't use cargo for to exist so. And and I guess for those who are just listening to us and not watching us as uh, live now, you know, for for those who are only listening to this and just got into the episode, you might also be surprised to realize that this is live, uh, because Ben and I are such good producers that it doesn't Our shine intro through. Definitely didn't make that clear. Yeah, um, but it the the way that this is represented in source code or in your cargo toml rather is that there's a new root level table in cargo toml that sort of you know square bracket lints and it has two subtables rust and clippy might be more down the line who knows uh, and inside each subtable you can define name of lint equals and then a string and that string can be allow warn deny or forbid in order to set what level you want that particular lint to be at when building the crate in question um, and, and as Ben was alluding to, you can also set this in a workspace by setting the workspace.lints table, and then you can inherit from that in any given package by saying, you know, lints table workspace equals true to inherit from the, the workspace table. And I will say, in regard to your uh, concern, I think if there exists a crate that builds with cargo, I think it's reasonable for the crate authors to expect it will only be built with cargo, um, and that it might require some tweaks to get it built with something else. It's a totally reasonable thing, right? It shouldn't be you know, overly burdensome, but I think it's it's not a, a big problem conceptually to to say, hey, like you know, as a crate author, we thought you'd be using cargo for this, and if you wanted something else, that's kind of on you. I think that's right. The next thing we got is also a, a cargo feature, which is cargo registry authentication. And this one I know has been a long time coming, trying to, I know the cargo team has spent a long time trying to figure out what is exactly the right way to land this. And it's really two features that sort of come together to bring this whole idea of having registry authentication. The first of them is credential providers. So the idea here is that you can now configure cargo and tell it how to get credentials for a given registry. So previously you would just need to like put like a, a string in dot cargo slash credentials dot toml in your home directory, which is, you know, totally fine way to work around it, but it was very, it was a very like static way to configure it. It's also not the most secure because now you have your secret, your like token being stored in a file somewhere. And so what has come with 174 is the idea of a credential provider, which is essentially a, a cargo now knows about a particular set of other utilities, like third party utilities that can provide it with credentials. Um, so an example of this would be like the keychain on Mac OS. Uh, I forget what the thing for Windows is called, uh, libsecret on Linux, um, and also this idea of a credential process, which is just some external program that Cargo will execute for you with a predefined set of arguments, and it's expected that it will output the credential that Cargo should use to standard out. And so this way you can now have both sort of a secure place to store your credentials. It doesn't have to be in a config file in your home directory, but it also means that if you have a, like an alternative registry, something that's not crates.io and it needs some very particular kind of token uh, and it wants to get those tokens in a very particular way, then you can now write a credentials provider for cargo that knows how to grab, you know, 
authentication tokens for that registry and and sort of feed them through uh, so that Cargo will present them to that alternate registry when it's also used. And so that's then the second part of this is support for alternative registries, like private registries, for example, to specifically be able to ask for credentials for all cargo operations uh, and to say that they should come in through one of these um, additional credential providers. There's a bunch more nuance here too. So if you uh, if you you're curious about this, the cargo docs are pretty good about this because this has been a long time coming of figuring out what the process should look like and you know what the what the protocol should look like for the credential providers and for the alternative registries. But the nice thing here, as a user of Rust, that we should hopefully end up seeing is more support for having you know private or custom Rust registries that are not just Crates.io. So this could be things like you could have a custom registry for use at work, for example that other people don't have access to because it publishes, let's say, company internal code. And previously that was possible, but securing them was really hard. Uh, and so now we have a better mechanism for doing so in such a way that you can imagine larger companies also um, are in a better position to provide sort of rust or cargo registries as a feature that, that you could sort of buy or, or um, use for, for your company from somewhere else. Um, the next thing in 174 is projections in opaque return types. What do you know of this one, Ben? Um, well, it's, so it's kind of just a way to uh, make, you know, it, it, opaque return types refers to impl trait, right? And so you, you have a function that returns uh, a thing that has, you know, a trait that all, all you know about it is it implements some trait. And so you write it as, you know, arrow, return arrow, impl trait. Um, and so in the past, there were some limitations there, and this is just lifting some limitations, um, uh, kind of like, you know, things that you expect should work now just work. Although uh, with regard to understanding why they didn't previously work or what projections really means, that's beyond me. I think hopefully the idea here is that we should just instead, rather than trying to, you know, explain to the user why it doesn't work, just make it work and <laughs> don't worry about what a projection is. Do you happen to know in compiler jargon what projection refers to? Uh, oh, I have to dig back into my compiler stuff but i i think projections here are like the idea is that if you have some type from the sort of input space that are represented in the output space but not visible in the source code so an example here would be like well i guess there's an example given in the code snippet mm -hmm. for this part of the changelog where you have a, a method on some wrapper type so you have an impl wrapper you have a function async fn that returns self then the source code just says self, but it actually includes the wrapper type. The wrapper type there being a little bit obvious, but the wrapper type also has a, an associated lifetime and generic type. And the, that associated lifetime and that generic type uh, have to be projected into the return type of that asynchronous function because they are there, they're just not named anywhere. Uh, and so I think that's what projection in general means, but I'm on, I'm on risky ground here. And I believe this has to do with, I mean, given that this is also indicated in the code sample, this specifically has to do with lifetimes. So I th think in the past, the sort of projection handling code for things like async functions and in, in traits or general like return position impl trait in traits as well, didn't mm -hmm. know how to project lifetimes correctly. And so therefore it, they just like disallowed them. Like if they detected that the input type had a lifetime in it and you tried to use it in the output type using self, then it would just reject that code. Um, just because the, the, the machinery for doing the projection correctly wasn't implemented there. And now, as you say, that limitation so, is, is raised and that is sort of the main, the most important thing. Thanks specifically here, right? You can you can now you know you, without having to worry about lifetimes or whatever, you can now say, hey, like you know, if you're uh, so in an impl trait, right? You can say like, you know, hey, like you know, the, the associated type of this trait that I'm impling for, I can give it, you know, I can say what it is. And in this case, you, know, you say you know, the item is equal to self. So impl iterator, iterator has associated type called item, which is the thing that returned from the iterator. And the examples here are okay, item can be self, where self is a type that returns some lifetimes or has lifetimes in, inside of it, uh, or it can be associated type, um, which is the thing that you couldn't do before. So it's kind of like, you know, a thing that you, like, you know, you, you expect to be able to use types in type position in general. And so it's kind of one of the things you don't need to talk about it or teach it. It's kind of just like, hey, like, you know, com you com take these two features and compose them and it should just work. And now it's one of those things where it's kind of like, hey, like, you know, uh, it just, uh, it, is, it would make the language more complex to not allow this and people can now do it. And it's just a, a nice, good thing. So we also have a bunch of stabilized APIs in this release. I think there's like one in particular that stands out to me, which is 
the error type in the standard IO modules, this is specifically IO errors, has gained a method called other. And this is really just a shorthand for std IO error new, where you pass in the error kind other and then some message. Um, or that message can be anything that implements the error trait. And now there's sort of a convenience method for constructing IO errors of the other type just by specifically calling the other constructor on IO error. So you can now do, you know, std IO error colon colon other and then pass in uh, something that implements error or rather technically something that implements into box din error. And that includes things like just normal strings. Uh, and it also includes, you know, most things that implement the error trait, I think, can be turned into box din errors. And so it's just a convenient type for turning errors or strings into IO errors, which are often the error type used in sort of these relatively low level libraries where the thing you bubble up is always an IO error because that's usually what you get from below. I think one of the things I like here in the stabilized APIs is this core num saturating. And I'm not sure, is this like, it's one of those things where you think it would exist before, right? And so in Rust, right, uh, uh, again, soapboxing, I'm trying to avoid it right here. But if you want to add a thing, it's like, well, if it overflows, do I want to panic? Do I want to wrap? Do I want to saturate? Is a thing you can always do, right? And in this case, saturating means, hey, like if this value would overflow, if I have 255 uh, and I add one to it, uh, is it going to panic, or is it going to wrap back to zero, or is it going to stay at 255? And that's ladder behavior. Saturating, it just says, hey, once you overflow the bound, just like just cap it right here and don't go any higher. Um, and so in Rust and standard library, there's different ways of doing this. You can either have just a normal integer, a normal int type, i32, say, and then call dot wrapping add dot saturating add, or much of what they say, maybe it's called saturating add or add saturating. Um, but the idea here is that you can, you know, say, hey, like, I just have a normal type, just do a single operation this way. Or for wrapping types, at least, right, there is a, an actual type where you can put your int inside the type, and now all operations become wrapping. And so in this case, it looks like it is now a saturating type where you put your into the type and now op operations become saturating. And so one of those things that you would think should exist and would have had for a long time, but I guess it just didn't. Yeah, I, I was surprised to see uh, that this was added here like separately from wrapping, because wrapping was added ages ago, I think. As I'm not sure why. One point oh, I'm pretty sure. Okay, yeah, so, look it up. So it's like so. surprising that saturating was only added now. But I guess maybe no one had a use for it. I think one of my favorite of these like wrapping types is um, re reverse or reversed. So this is a wrapper type that the only thing it does when it implements partial ORD and ORD for the underlying type, it inverts the ordering. So if you have a, you know, if you have a vector of u size and you call sort, they get sorted in ascending order. But if you have a vector of reversed u size, uh, then and then call vec sort, then you get them in descending order. Apart from that, it just directly gives you access to the underlying type. Does not implement any other semantics. The only thing it does is it reverses sort order. Um, and the main use for this, I think, is for binary heaps because it allows you to turn the max heap that we have a stand in the standard library into a min heap by just wrapping all, oh yeah, std comp reverse because the binary heap implementation just makes use of partial ord. We have a couple more compatibility notes in 174 as well. Um, so previously we were talking about how a couple of Windows platforms were being deprecated in an upcoming release. And in 174, a couple of Apple platforms have been deprecated. So in particular, uh, Mac OS versions prior to Sierra, iOS prior to version 10, and tvOS prior to version 10. Um, and I think here, we're actually gonna hold off on talking about this because there's, there's an upcoming release where I have seen into the future. And I know that there's a change that lets me talk about why it's important to deprecate old platforms. And so I'm gonna not talk about this here, I think, if that's okay with you, Ben. Sure. With regard to uh, some of these standard library stabilizations here, I think I kind of want to talk about a little bit. Um, so core mem transmute copy is now stable in const contexts, right? And so I'm trying to think. So it, it implies transmute copy is just transmute, but more, right? So it's yeah, transmute, transmute copy is, is like a, the worst. It's like the worst of the crime you can commit in Rust, right? You can do with transmute uh, one of copy. The worst. I think mem initialized is still the worst crime. It's a, it's it's oh, transmute copy is like you know imagine one of those things where it's like it's not illegal, but you shouldn't do it. Whereas mem initialized is illegal. Just like just yeah. don't no no yeah right to jail, right? Um, and so I'm just curious why like I, I'm gonna go look at you know transmute and see when that was const stable. And I'm wondering why transmute copy uh, presumably took longer. 
yeah, so Transmute was constable in 1.56. Um, so it took 20 more releases for a Transmute copy. I'm not sure if it's nobody actually wanted it. Maybe it was kind of like, ooh, gross, I don't want to use that. Or if it was actually some, uh, some better reason. So I'm not quite sure. I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, I wonder if it has to do with the generics involved? No, they have the same generics. They have the same, the same signature. So. Source, reference, transmute. No, uh, transmute copy takes a reference instead of taking oh, the owned right. version. So maybe it has to do I with never use it enough to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it might that. be that it has to do with uh, using accessing references for cons in cons context. Maybe. Okay. I don't know. Interesting. Or maybe they uh, weren't sure that it was sound. Things. I don't know. I have maybe. not used transmute copy for anything. I can't I've, imagine it would be like you know any more unsound. Uh, than transmute in terms of like Miri's ability to <laughs> understand it. So I don't know. I just love that it's uh, it's in the sort of description here. It says uh, they, I think it there used to be a line in here I thought that said like this is worse than transmute, but it seems like it is not. Maybe maybe it's just a fever dream I've had. I think it's time for the change log review of one seventy four. One of the things that Cargo gained in 174 is the keep going flag, which I, I love the name of this one. So this is a flag that you can pass to Cargo build and Cargo test and Cargo check. And it tells Cargo to continue building or running checks or whatever, even if it has hit a hard error. So imagine that you're doing a build of your crate and it has like a bunch of different targets. Like imagine it has um, a library and a binary being a good example. And the library and the binary maybe have different sets of dependencies or something, or you could have a workspace where you have crates that have different dependencies and cargo starts building and then it hits an error in a dependency that is only used for one of the targets that it's building. Like it's only used for the test things that you're building, for example, but it might still be able to build the library. In the normal case, if you run cargo check, like dash dash all targets, for instance, then what it will do, the moment it hits a first build error, cargo will exit and it will sort of finish up any current concurrent builds it's doing, but then it will exit. The keep going flag tells cargo to build as much as it can. So even if it's hit an error, so it knows the compilation will ultimately fail, it tells it to keep trying to build all the other dependencies that you can still build, uh, build all the other targets you might still be able to build. And I think the idea for this one was in part to just give me as many errors as possible on screen so that I don't have to like get one error and then fix it and then build again and then get one error and then fix it and then do it again to just have cargo give me all of them all at once or at least as many as you can it's also just motivational in its naming keep going cargo you could do it another one that i had that is pretty neat is for this is also a cargo one so there are some of the cargo commands, and I think update is probably the most common of them, where you can pass the dash P flag to say, you know, cargo update dash P 30. And what that will do is will specifically update 30, but not update any of your other dependencies. So like if you're in cargo update, it's going to update all of the dependencies in your lock file all at once, but cargo update dash P lets you say, just update this one. But if you have multiple major versions of a dependency by that name, then cargo will error and say, you need to tell me which of them. Let's say you do cargo update dash P um, hyper, then it might say, well, but you have hyper 0.14.7 and you have hyper 1.0.0. Which of them do you want me to update? And previously cargo would require that you give the full version string in order to update so you would have to say like cargo update dash p hyper at 0 0.14.7 even though all that you really needed was 0 0.14 or if you wanted to update one all you really needed was hyper at one uh, and so in 174 cargo update and, and similar commands that take dash p got smarter and now they only require you to give as much of the version as is necessary, so basically the major version, in order to disambiguate the choice that you had. Uh, so this is another one of those like developer experience improvements that is really appreciated. And then I have some Rust doc things that I thought were neat. One of them is Rust doc now supports warning blocks. So 
in the doc string for a function or type, whatever, you know, you can already put markdown, you can put bold and paragraphs and images and whatever you want. But now you can also specifically by using inline HTML, make Rust doc print like a, a warning box that shows up as a warning box in the output of the function, like in the in the docs that get rendered. And you do it by writing, it's a open angle bracket div class equals, and then double quotes warning, and then end angle bracket. And it needs the start and the end div need to be on their own line because markdown and inline HTML are weird. Um, but anything you put in between those div lines will render as like a little warning thing with an orange bar on the left to indicate to people, this is serious, make sure you look at this carefully. I'm curious why this needed to be a support. I thought markdown just supported inline HTML. So it does. Um, the difference here is that now they're styled. Oh, so okay. so otherwise, in the style, yeah, standardized. Okay. Yeah. Maybe so they were previously piggybacking on like so some warning class that was already existing somewhere. I, I don't actually so. know. I don't know if you could do this before or whether if you put div class warning, it would just be a div, but it wouldn't be styled any specially. Well, I mean, you know, Rust doc. Look at the output. There are things that are like you know warning like. Uh, in the output that you could have said, hey, I'm just going like, you know, to reuse this class. Oh, and, like, yeah, you know, that's true. to hope for the fact that you know, you're colliding with the uh, the pre-provided CSS from Rustock to oh, style I see, different. Yeah. Maybe it's a blessed way of doing it, so now we're not going to break this. No, so. now it's like officially supported. Mm -hmm. And then the other one, and this gets at the search things that have been improved last time. In 174, we got support for generic type parameters in signature search in Rustock search. So now you can do things like in the Rust doc search field, write option of option of T arrow option of T. And it will give you all functions whose signature takes an option of option of T and returns an option of the same type T. Like it recognizes that the T's here should be the same. Um, you can similarly also search for things like option of T to option of U to indicate that it turns one option into a different type of option. Uh, and so I think it's a really cool indication that this sort of signature based search in, in Rustock is getting, you know, it's not full featured, but it is actually at least getting pretty damn useful. But now I'm curious though, because I, I assume, I think actually in the past at least that Rustock search was all local. Like it was just like had like a local index of like everything in the crate and it was just doing a, like a text search over it. It wasn't doing a network request. And so is there like some kind of type parser or like logic yeah, I, for doing type relative searches now in Rustock, like running in JavaScript in your browser? You know, I don't really know. I my my guess here is that there's some like additional file that's included somewhere. I maybe they like maybe they do it all from JavaScript. I'm not sure. Let's look at the PR here. How to read Rustock, the search interface. Searching by type signature, search.md, HTML render. There's a search index, search corrections. You know, I'm not sure how they do this, but it could actually be that this is all like implemented in pure JavaScript. Because I'm looking at a JavaScript file here now called function check generics. And it calls the function unify function types, which mm -hmm. I was wondering if they had unification which, <laughs> in JavaScript, That'd which makes me think that they might actually have implemented this whole thing in JavaScript, which is nuts. Oh, someone in chat is saying uh, it's all from JavaScript. There's a local index file storing all the necessary information. I see. So, so like all the type signatures get dumped to some file as part of the output of Rustock. And so JavaScript just has a access to a list of all the type signatures, I guess. You'd still need to know that, like, you know, T, you know, a T and a T and a U and a T are, like, you know, representing different things. Yeah, it's true. I don't know. It's just really neat. And and again, an indication that, like, the Rustock search is getting pretty good. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I this is something that um, Haskell's search is notoriously good at. And it's nice to see that investment is being made in, in the direction of Rust 2. It's just now people need to also be aware of it because once you're aware of the power of searching by type signatures, you start to get addicted to it. There were a couple of other things that were buried in the change log that I thought were interesting. One of them was an implementation of the step trait for IP addresses. And this was wild to me. So the step trait is the thing that lets you construct a range. So the range type 
is like, you know, if you do a range from one to four, like one dot dot four, it works because u size implements step. And so there's a way to step from one to two to three to four. And an implementation of step for IP addresses means that you can now say, you know, you can create an IP address for 10.0.0.1 and an IP address for 10.0.0.255. And you can write for IP in IP1 dot dot IP2. And it works. D is step the like thing that lets ranges work, or is it just the thing that lets you like you know go by a specific step for every individual range? Like, does it already exist range iterators over IP addresses, or is this no? Like, it a new I don't thing? think it does. I don't think there's already a range of IP addresses. I think it's specifically step that lets you do it. Okay. Uh, which I think is just <laughs> super neat. I don't I don't really have a use case for this, but like. It's neat that you can do this. And, and I think the reason you're able to, right, is because IP ad IPv4 addresses are just 32-bit integers. And IPv6 addresses are just 64-bit integers. So clearly they implement step because it's just increment the underlying U32 like, or U64. So uh, let's see. see if there's like, also, like, there are, the question is, right, like, there are, like, some invalid, uh, depending on weird context, right, like, the, the local, like, 127 those are all like you know for local use only that kind of thing and so like it's not like a, a flat namespace there are like you know reserved addresses like you know there's the yeah. back address it doesn't look thing. like it deals with any of those it just increments the number uh the okay. acp uh, is all about uh, extended logic for ip networks and it talks about implementing not bit and bit or leading zeros leading ones trailing zeros trailing ones uh, it says the primary use case for most workflows would be filtering, such as allow listing or deny listing, ranges of IPs for connections, although more dedicated networking code that routes traffic among several hosts could also benefit from this. Okay, so somebody was writing a firewall in Rust and wanted to be able to say, hey, block this IP range. Yeah, I guess so. It's neat. Yeah. Are there are two more things that changed in 174. One of them was a, a lint called uh, private in public that got very much changed in 174. And I think you were part of these discussions, Ben, is that right? Um, possibly uh, in some degree, but I was not the driver for this. Because uh, I think- I'm not, not really, yeah. Yeah, well, I was gonna say, I think your, <laughs> I think your name was mentioned in the, um, in the discussion for this. Let me see if I can dig it up. So the private and public lint, the intent of it is to warn you if you have a, a public type that is in a private module. So it's not actually accessible anywhere, but the visibility modifier on the thing suggests that it should be. Yeah, this is a very old discussion. So I wouldn't be surprised if I'm in here somewhere, but uh, I might not yeah. have the uh, context from a discussion from 10 years ago paged in. No, uh, that's yeah, fair. I mean, I think if I can uh, think about what my opinion would be, I think I'm like extremely in favor of making sure that, so okay, in, in Rust, right? Unsafe code is a thing. Unsafe blocks are a thing. One of the things about unsafe blocks is that kind of like if you're in a module, a Rust module, that contains an unsafe block, well, what is the, the, the danger, right? Because, you know, an unsafe block represents some invariant that must be upheld uh, and is, you know, currently being, you know, manually upheld. Um, and then if you make any change in the module, uh, you might be in some way invalidating the invariant that that unsafe block assumes. And so whenever you make a change in a module that contains an unsafe block, you need to check to make sure that every unsafe block in that module, the invariant has remained the same, right? And it's kind of like, oh no, it's like, where is the, the boundary of this? If I need to like, you know, change like, you know, this unsafe block in like the entire crate, the entire crate graph, and the idea, the, the actual, the, the boundary at, at best is the module level. And the reason this is the module level is because of privacy. It's because, you know, whenever you are in a module, you have access to every field, public or private, of any type defined in that module. And so uh, it means that, you know, in theory, you could like, you know, the the burden of you as a module author is to make sure that your public API is, you know, contains either things that cannot violate invariance or that can, but are marked as unsafe functions. And so uh, in theory, you, you kind of want to make sure that privacy is a, a very strict thing because you don't want any, uh, you, know, you don't know what kind of thing might go wrong if a thing that you think assume is private actually is public and leaks out somehow. Um, and so, I mean, actually, there is, you know, some... It's, it's harder than you think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, well, I, think, down, but. I think what's interesting here is that the compiler is very strict about enforcing that things that aren't supposed to be public don't make it public. Like you can't accidentally leak something. It has to be marked as pub for exactly the reasons you outline. The, the private and public lints, I think, are trying to get at the opposite problem, which is if you 
you meant to make something public. That's why you wrote like pubfn. But because of your module structure or something, there's like a, a parent module that's not pub, and therefore the type you thought was public wasn't. And so that is going to be confusing to your users. Oh. Yeah, that's the question though. Is like, did you did you actually mean it? The reason right. the process doesn't go through and like you know say oh you did mean this is because like you can have a type that is public in this module but not public you know exposed from the entire crate, right? Say, or like to this module over here, and so. And, and I think what what was really interesting when I when I was skimming through this for one seventy four was that one of the things that's happened is that the private and public lint has basically been removed and it's been replaced with two or three. Uh, more specific lints, one that talks right. about types, one that talks about traits, and one that talks about Voldemort types. Uh, <laughs> and I don't exactly know what Voldemort types are, but they're described in the RFC. The opaque. Yeah. yeah. So. so that's what D, the language, calls them Voldemort types because they cannot be named. Nice. Um, I like that. He who must not be named. Uh, and so I kind of don't like clever names like that. I, I don't even like infiltrate. I prefer saying opaque types. Um, nice. So. And what, what about existential types? No, never. Don't even dare. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what what I do, what I did find interesting though, was was reading through this RFC that talks about both why the lint was split and what these new defined uh, lints are like. So this is RFC twenty one forty five. So if anyone's curious about the sort of nuances of of private and public visibility, uh, I recommend giving that a read. I, I at least thought it was pretty interesting. And then I think the last thing I have for one seventy four at least is there was a change to the cargo recommendation for what to do with cargo lock files. So previously, before 174, cargo generally recommended that libraries should not check in their cargo lock, but binaries should. And the a change that happened in 174 is that the cargo new command will no longer ignore, like put cargo.lock in your git ignore, incentivizing you to, to check it in. And in fact, there was a longer blog post as well talking about this change in policy and, and why it is. Uh, and I, I recommend you go read it. I think the, the high level summary is that it is useful to have cargo lock checked in so you can more easily do things like git bisect the history of your crate in order to find where an issue was reproduced and actually build with the dependencies at the time. Uh, it makes things like keeping a minimum supported Rust version easier. And the cost of checking in your lock file has gone down because we have tools like Dependabot and Renovate that will bump it for you. And so that combination of factors means that now the, the sort of trade-off is more in favor of checking in your cargo lock um, and then just having additional mechanisms for the things that not checking in our cargo lock would normally buy you. Right, and it still doesn't change the actual behavior of cargo, which is to ignore lock files in libraries. And so it's important to yep. understand. That's totally true. I think that's all I had for 174. Did you have anything else? That's all I had for 174, but we do have a point release, 1.74.1. Oh, man, I love and point releases. Actually, there's really anything super interesting in here. Some, like, you know, uh, some LLVM thing. Uh, but uh, I did see, we were talking before, we were joking before about how your current PR, bring back the meta narrative, the overarching narrative, your current PR, uh, we should wait for a point release to get this in there. One of the items of in this uh, point release is just like a... Uh, a, a single line change or a single word change uh, to standard mem discriminants just to, you know, clarify the actual rules of, you know, what you can and cannot transmute. And it's very funny to see, like, you know, the, the change being, okay, go from talking about lifetimes to going about free lifetimes and saying, okay, it was, it was important enough to have a point release for. See, so. I think that means there's hope for our PR. And I think it is. I mean, yeah, it's a good news. We just need to okay. Again, now, now we're on our Act Two of our uh, narrative here, which is yep. now we need to find a severe security flaw in <laughs> Rust C right. and patch it within the next two hours, so that yep. we can then justify a point release and say, while you're at it, oh, uh, might as well go through and improve his PR too. Why not? Yeah, and then we can point to the to one seventy four point one that commit and say, There's here's an example of where you've done it before. Mm -hmm. Actually, I guess given we're done with 174, we can go look at the PR and see how it's doing. Oh yeah, let's uh, let's bring it back around. <laughs> Any progress? Uh, let's see. It has my PR has two hearts now. That's good. I'll take that. <laughs> um, that common thread is resolved. This thread is going. Oh, this is a discussion about the side effect of shrink shrink to fit. Oh, I know what this is talking about. I'll show you in a second. And then this is me apologizing for it being a live, live stream. And Neil's giving a thumbs up. I'll take it. 
Let's see. So this is here. So we changed the documentation for into boxed stir to say before doing the conversion, this method discards X's capacity like shrink to fit. And then we, so that is already what's on vec into box slice, but we added the line, note that the shrink to fit call may reallocate and copy the bytes of the string. And I think the call out here is that it's, it feels weird to talk about a side effect of a different method in the documentation for this method, mm -hmm. right? Like this is the documentation for into box string, but it talks about the side effect of shrink to fit because that's the thing that we call. And I think that's an interesting one. I guess one of the ways we could fix this is to just say, note that this call may reallocate and copy the bytes of the string, just to avoid the, the mention here. Sure. Oh, now I need to remember where that is. just squash it again? Yeah, library alloc uh, source string, no. I'm going to get a head start in the intermission between releases here and refill my T. Go for it. How about we do, note that this call may reallocate and couple the bytes of the string. If you don't want that behavior, prefer use leak instead. But that's also not quite true because leak isn't the same because it doesn't give you a box back. So leak isn't really the alternative to this. It would have to be a variant that gives you a box stir. Okay, let's maybe just leave it as this then. Oh no, Rust format tried to format the code of the standard library. That feels like a bad idea. And I guess I could also do, yeah, no, that's fine. Push force, uh, change the side effect. Uh, writing to not talk about shrink to fit. Causing the, the Rust CI to spin more than should otherwise be needed. And I will also edit this so that the eyes are visible to indicate my, my captivity. Excellent. I still think there's hope that this will land. I guess now we're up to the last release of 2023. Feels like yesterday. Uh, okay, Ben, it is now suddenly December 28th, 2023, and a very, very serious, severe thing has happened, which is that Rust 175 has released. And it is one that the, I'm just setting the scene here. Uh, the crowd has gone silent waiting for this day because finally, uh, in Rust 175, we got async FN and return position infiltrate in traits. And the All crowd right, let's goes wild. Let's move on to pointer byte offset APIs. <laughs> the crowd has gone wild. And uh, we can't even hear ourselves over the, the sounds of the masses. Uh, ben, why did this take so, so long and why is it exciting? Oof. Okay. So async FN is kind of a big deal. Uh, the idea here is that uh, this came in 2018 the ability to return a future from a trait. And this is not kind of like, you know, the, the functionality that landed in 2018, well, lots, of, lots of stuff landed in that, in that kind of like a push for async in Rust in general, but the async offend stuff was not that uh, interesting. It was kind of just in a general function, async offend is just sugar for a function that returns a future. Right, uh, and so kind of like there is like you know the type that you you type async fn returns foo, it'll return actually oh it's a future of foo, item equals foo. Is it, is it item in the future? Um, no, and so, out, um, output. You might, it's output. Output equals foo. Yeah, uh, and then so um, but uh, so trait methods right 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 methods are just functions that live inside of an input block. What's the big deal? Um, and so oh wow, it's like so much to unpack here of why it's a big deal. I know that's the question you asked, and that's that's why you want me to to talk about this. Oh, but the idea here is that the thing that you return actually is not. Uh, do you have a better way of putting it? You're the async guy. You wrote a whole book about this. Um, <laughs> um, le okay, let me try. So I actually, I gave a talk about this too, uh, a little bit mm -hmm. before it stabilized, uh, because I'm a time traveler. Um, so yeah, and I guess the question I am, why is, why is the return type of an async function an associated type? Why can't it just be like a normal type, right? Okay, so there, there are a bunch of ways in which this is real weird. But the the most straightforward way to explain it is, when you implement a trait, 
that has an asynchronous function or, or indeed any function that returns an input trait. Because really asyncfn is a sugar for a function that returns an impl future. Right? And then internally contains an async block. So async events are not any harder, really, than a return position impl trait in traits. So why are those hard? Well, the reason why having return position impl trait in traits is hard is because when you implement the trait, you need to say how large and like, you need to say what the type is of the thing that you return. And the reason why you need to know what the type is is because imagine that I have some trait and that trait has a method that returns impl trait. Someone who calls that method needs to put the return value somewhere. That means that they need to allocate space on their stack to put that value. The problem is they don't know what that type is. They just don't know that it's something that implements trait. And so you could say, well, the implementer of the trait knows what the type is. Sure, but they don't have anywhere to put that type because there's no associated type that holds that type information that the caller can then look at. So one of the reasons why this was complicated was to figure out how do we get the type through all of the machinery so that the callers actually know at least how much space to allocate for the return type and, and then know how to call the, the appropriate methods on it. Right, but I guess the question here then is why was it so much harder for trait methods and not for functions which still use impl trait for their, so, their future stuff? So the reason why it's easier for functions is because for functions, when you call the function, you have direct access to the function definition, right? Because they're one and the same. When you have a trait in between, all you know at the call site is that you have something that implements the trait. At that point, you don't know the specific type. And this gets into monomorphization versus dynamic dispatch. In the dynamic dispatch case, right? imagine you have a, an ampersand din trait. Then you don't have the underlying type at all. You just have a pointer to the data and you have a pointer to the, the V table. right? So you, you have no information about the actual underlying type, which means that the only information you have is what is in the V table, the stuff that got preserved as part of turning it into a dynamic trait object. In the monomorphized case, so if you call a function that is generic over t, where t is this trait that has a return position impl trait, then for each monomorphization of that function, you do know the original type. And so you could figure out what the return position type is, but you, you need code to handle this case. You need code in the monomorphization code to figure out what is the true type that goes in this particular method call. And so the, the real oh, problem correct. is that you're sort of, you're one removed from the definition when you go through a trait. Like you're correct that the information takes its runtime, but I mean, the, the counterpoint to that is that uh, this is all a compile time construct and we are allocating space in the stack and we do know the return type of the impl trait, the thing, the actual type of the opaque type that will be returned. If we're the compiler, maybe in a different crate, it could be different. Might need some kind of metadata to actually transmit that, that information. But like, again, why is it harder for functions? Like, right, there is this trait level interposing here, but why is the compiler have a hard time understanding well, uh, what the well, actual type is? So, so there are two parts of this. The first of them is that once you start bringing trait objects and dynamic dispatch into the picture here, the compiler doesn't know either because it might be determined mm -hmm. at runtime which specific type gets passed in. Because you could have something that's like, you know, if the user pressed A, then construct uh, a value of this type, turn it into a box din of the trait, and then call this function. And if the user pressed B, then use this other type and construct it, turn it into a trait object and add it to this function. And so in that case, the compiler cannot know. Uh, so for trait objects, it's actually complicated regardless because the compiler doesn't have the information. Uh, although that is something that they have some ideas for how to implement, but was not, I think, in the V1 here. But on the sort of static side, on the non-trait object side, you're totally right that the compiler does have all the information, which in some sense is why we have now gotten this feature, is because the compiler does have the information. I think much of the complexity came from how does the compiler thread all that information through in such a way that we actually know we've covered all the cases, we do it all correctly, it's all sound, both type theoretically, but also sort of memory safety implementation wise. And there are a bunch of nuances here too, around lifetime captures and the like that I don't think we should get into here, but, but there's a bunch of sort of related, but not quite the same problem. And to give a sort of a little bit of color to that for, as an example of why it's complicated, imagine that you have a, an asynchronous function 
in a trait, uh, and it takes an argument that is a reference to a foo. And it uses that reference to a foo inside of the returned future. And so now the, the, the future that you return actually has an associated lifetime with it as well, because it's tied to the lifetime borrow of foo. And so now you need an async events to always declare in all of your return types, which lifetimes from the inputs they borrow from, because that would be a pain. And also you don't even have a way to express this to say that, you know, if you define an async fn bar um, that takes a, a reference to a foo argument, where would you write that the future that this asynchronous function returns is tied to the lifetime of the foo argument? because you would need to be able to talk about your own return value that is the return value of the function, not of the asynchronous function, right? It's a property of the future and not the return type of the future. And so there's a bunch right. of these like weird nuances of how do you even express this? Um, and, and we're still not fully there. There are still a bunch of things that the machinery that was landed in 175 can't do. Some examples of this being, I think, trait objects and, uh, it also can't really easily express uh, being generic over send bounds. So you can't, for example, have a, a trait that it has an async fn and you want to say, you know, where this type implements this trait and the futures are sent is not a thing that you can express in 175. Right. I think, you know, the uh, the underlying question of why was this harder for methods as opposed to free functions really you know, partially comes down to the lifetime issue because um, you know, the lifetimes are you know tied to the trait here in some cases and the implementer might determine that. Um, and so trying to figure out how to express this is a reason that we needed to express the return future as an associated type. Um, and then once you do that, there's another problem, which is that associated types in traits couldn't be generic until very recently. Right. And so what was that like 72? Something, Something like that. that. Uh, it was it was you know twenty twenty three. No, seventy one, I think. Because seventy two, we've talked about, and we didn't talk about that. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it must be one seventy seventy or so seventy one. So you decide that once because of references and lifetimes that you need your futures to be associated types on the traits. Now you need to think, okay, well now all the other problems associated types limitations that exist currently in the you know whatever you know infiltrate stuff or the associated type stuff. Now we need to fix those too, and that took a long time. Right. And so it's been like, you know, 2018 was the uh, the first release of stable async await and rust. And now in 2023 it was like five years later of like, you know, first of all, how, what do we do we need to do? How do we do it? And then doing it and then testing it. And does it work as actually like fit? And I think in between they realized, oh, this is actually like a huge extension. This is like the biggest extension to the type of since, you know, 1.0. Uh, and they actually created a new team in the Rust organization, the types team, I think in response to this, we're kind of like, hey, we're, we're worried that if we do this wrong, we will make our type system no longer sound, we'll totally break the language. And so we want to have a lot of assurance that what we're doing is actually like correct. And so there is now a types team whose job is just to think hard about like any uh, type system extension and make sure that they haven't invalidated the entire point of the language, which is to have a sound type system uh, to enforce memory safety. And so that's that's the goal here. Uh, I think what why it took so long is because it was actually uh, lots of you know, this requires this requires this requires this, and you end up yak shaving for years in you know a ankle deep in a a type checker, which is one of those things that's kind of like very like you know you need a certain kind of knowledge that's like not super common. Uh, you need to have you know some like type theory background and like you know be very meticulous about what what you're doing, and just like took a long time things will happen unless someone does them right it's a volunteer project and so somebody had to who knew had the expertise needed to actually go through and think about all this stuff for years and years and so uh i'm thankful they did it's like you know you know people who are unsung heroes of the project who like spent all this time <laughs> working on this stuff and i uh I, I applaud you yeah i think i think you're right i think the other thing that's interesting is it was also a matter of it was not just a matter of there's a long chain of things we need to do and they're all kind of complicated it was also a matter of discovery right like when we thought that we were ready to, okay, we have all the parts now, discovering another instance of, oh, but we haven't thought of, or, oh, but what about? Like, I think the send bound stuff being one example of something where I think there was an indication early on that we probably needed something like return type notation, but I don't think it became quite visible how severe that limitation was until we got closer to stabilization to the point where like the announcement post that talks about async fn is very clearly stipulating that you probably don't want to use this for anything where you want to be generic over a trait that has async fn's where you care about whether the functions are sent mm -hmm. 
Uh, I do love the line in the 175 release notes, though, to say, it's expected that these limitations will be lifted in future releases. And I'm very curious to see how far ahead those future releases are. I mean, it's better to have it than to not have it. Once you are, as long as you're, not, you're sure you're not like, you know, like doing a thing you need to regret later and ping something in the corner, it's still like, you know, it's better to get it out in people's hands because, I mean, at that point, it creates pressure on you to actually do it. Uh, I think that's true. Rust, kind of like, you know, also things in Rust are kind of like, you know, they're, they have been like in nightly for like years. can be like, where's the progress on this? And it's kind of like, well, you know, do we wait until it's perfect to get it out or do we try and do an MVP? And the MVP approach ends up being the actual thing that actually ships. I think there's so. an even stronger argument here, actually, because I was following some of the debate about do we stabilize what we have so far or not. Uh, and th there is actually a decent argument for stabilizing this because it's useful even without the other things that we know are needed for some parts of adoption. So one of the arguments I saw was that in embedded programming, there are a bunch of cases where you really want the ability to have, you know, async dependent traits, for example, but you don't care about send because you only have a single core anyway. And so all of the sort of runtimes in that space aren't multi-threaded. They don't require send. And so please give this to us, even though that like don't block on the send stuff because we don't care about it. And it would be super useful for us to have what you have already. Mm -hmm. I think we should move on to the other headline feature of 175, which is, of course, pointer byte offset APIs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this one, too, though, is interesting because I think this has also been in the works for quite some time, uh, but for, I think, very different reasons. So the, the idea here is that when you have raw pointers in Rust, so this being, you know, star cons t and, and star mu t, um, when you add to them, when you do arithmetic on them, you do arithmetic in units of the size of t. So if you add one to a, a star const t pointer, what you're really adding it in terms of like the, the actual number that makes up the pointer is you add the size of t to the, the sort of number of bytes in that pointer. And that's usually what you want anyway, right? If you, if you think of something like using a, a pointer to move through an array, you want to add if you add one, you want that to move you to the next element in the array, not to move you one into the element, the first element of the array. But there are use cases where you truly want to operate on the bytes. And I think one of the things that held this up, because it landed in 175 with the, the method names being byte add, byte offset, byte offset from, and byte sub, and then also wrapping byte add, wrapping byte offset, wrapping byte sub. And I think the naming held this up a decent amount. Like, what should this actually be called? Um, this happens a lot, yeah. Yeah. Bike shining uh, is real. Bike shining is real, but but I also do think it's kind of important because you want to pick names that are, I don't want to say guessable, but are sort of in line with the rest of the language so that you can mm -hmm. generally, like, things feel the same when you move from one place to another. And even things like, should it be wrapping byte add or should it be byte wrapping add? And it doesn't mm -hmm. matter, but if everything in the standard library had the the, na the words in different orders, it would be pretty confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when you're establishing yeah, a new they're, precedent... They're totally valid. Wrapping yeah. Add, but wrapping add, and so it's kind of just like, pick one and be consistent in the future. So And, and so is add byte wrapping. Mm -hmm. It's just not consistent with what the standard library does well, elsewhere. I think wrapping add is already has precedence from other integer operations. So yeah, in that exactly. case, we don't want to, you know, it just... You, Take whatever is you know expected, and we already have wrapping add, and so put the byte somewhere in there, but put wrapping before add. That's all yep. we know. Yep. But but at least now we have them. I mean, previously you could do this too. It was just pretty annoying. But now there's sort of a, a nice method you can call that does the thing that you expect it would. And I think specifically the way you would do this in the past is you would cast it to a star const u8, and then add one or add however many bytes, and then cast it back, which works. It's just really inconvenient. The next one is code layout optimizations for Rust C. So specifically, the Rust compiler is now built with um, Bolt, which is this fancy like binary optimization thing that I think came out of Clang and LVM. So the idea here is you build your program, you run your program on a bunch of like real inputs or real looking inputs, and you run a profiler while you run the program. And then you recompile your program and you give the profiler output to the compiler so that it knows which functions are most called in reality. Like it basically gives the compiler more information about the actual execution patterns of the code to try to make better decisions about things like inlining. Well, I think so. So Bolt, though, so you're talking about PGO, 
right? So PGO is the thing where you, you know, it's kind of like a GI, so a GIT in Java, right? You have your GIT mm -hmm. and like, I think that a GIT can do that a time of time compiler like Rust normally can't do is that it can look at the actual, like how the code's being used and optimize it based on kind of like, if you can't decide, you know, if you're probably ahead of time, oh, you have to guess about like, maybe I should inline this function, maybe I should inline this. If you're using a GIT, you can say, hey, I know this is being used, inline that for sure. Um, right. And so if you have a, is there a thing called PGO where it's you run a program and you create a profile of it? Like, so Firefox uses this, Chrome uses this to say, and hey, like, is what are the general, you know, standard? It, huh? It's called like profile. It's PGO is short for Pro profile guided, guided optimization. optimization. Okay. Uh, and so we click this profile, which is like, you know, it is, says how this is actually being used. Then we use this to optimize. So we can say, hey, okay, we can see at runtime, this is actually being used a lot. So inline this. Um, Bolt here is something different. Bolt is about optimizing the layout of the actual, like the, for the linker. And so it puts less, it's about, right? So when you, when you run code, there's an, uh, you, the actual data that is your code that goes in a cache in the CPU. And like, if it, you know, loads things more efficiently, your code can run faster because it's less fetching of code from the binary. Um, and so this, this, this actually like it, it, like a jigsaw puzzle, it rearranges the sections in your binary so that like it, the linker is more effective, right? Or I guess, you know, the, um, the, the loader is more effective whenever it loads them. And so it's a link time thing. Um, I, th so I thought it could. PGO. I thought it could optimize the code as well, but maybe I'm just completely maybe misremembering. Maybe when I first looked at it years ago, it was just a, a way of you know the, the layout of the binary so that when it gets loaded, it's more efficient. Yeah, because I remember um, this is a while ago now, so it could <laughs> look be there. Let's, let's look at it in real time and see who's correct. Yeah. The, so one of the differences that I seem to remember about Bolt was that it allows you to optimize based on a profile that's gathered with a binary that was built by someone else. So one of the problems you have with PGO is that you need to build the binary and then you need to profile with the binary that you built. And then you need to compile with the output from the profiling with the exact same tool chain. So that all of the like, like it needs more information about things like the, the internals of the compiler at the time of building that leak over through the profiling and back into the compiler. Whereas I think for Bolt, it only cares about the symbols that make it into dwarf anyway. And so it's easier to like take the binary and ship it out to a bunch of places and then recompile it later on elsewhere and still make use of, of the profiling information. So I thought yeah, that I really, was one I of the benefits. Of a profile. But I don't think it's going to, so it's not like a code gen level thing, unlike PGO and LLVM. I don't think it's going to like make an optimization decision beyond okay. rearranging how things are laid out in the binary. But you Interesting. can click, click the link. Click the link and oh, find yeah. out. It says, this is the documentation from the LLVM project. Bolt is a post link optimizer developed to speed up large applications. It achieves the improvements by optimizing applications code layout based on execution profile gathered by sampling profilers such as the perf tool. Well, there we go. It's only linker. I'm entirely wrong. It's still an improvement. So yeah, yeah and yeah, I think yeah. you know, I, I believe Rust C has been built with PGO for a while now, uh, and it also talks about here how we're talking about now we're building Rust C with code units equals one, and so like the the maximum uh, performance profile uh, eke out that 1.5 percent improvement in the benchmarks, which is important. I mean, if you ship a compiler to a million people and they all save 1.5 percent of their compile time, which they compile frequently, that's like a lot of time saved. Which I mean, yeah, these, these steps take a lot of time. Like, right, I don't know about Rust C, but I know that in Firefox and Chrome, a full like uh, release build takes over a day, 24 hours or more, because they do all this like super optimization with the profile and like the PGO and uh, all that stuff. And so, uh, but you know, if obviously for if you have like, you know, users, a hundred million users using your browser, then, you know, any, saving a single millisecond adds up over yeah. time. And so that's what's worth doing. So it, it is interesting though, that it says here in the announcements too, that the optimizations are limited to x86, 64 Linux. Um, do you know anything about the expand, uh, the extension of this to like other architectures and other platforms? I, I think, um, part of the difficulty is getting CI. Uh, to have like you know like you know, the, the builders for Macs are like slower I think like the bottleneck and so if you like make those even slower then suddenly everything gets slower and so it might just be a, a timing thing where like Linux ones are already idle uh, although it doesn't need to be every single one you only need to build these on unreleased ones but I mean still it's a kind of a big deal and I think it, again it's like kind of like LLD right another project where like it might just be more mature um, Linux GNU as opposed to Windows or Mac yeah it could uh, be. I don't know well, I was sure. even thinking so. like ARC64 like ARM processors but for Linux. But yeah, maybe no, support, maybe I mean, no I, one I cares about Arch64 for, for Linux. I mean, you can go back to the Bolt page and see what they support. 
Um, I, again, it's all just elf, though, right? It's just like rearranging your elf. I assume it's just like you have an elf binary rearrange, and it shouldn't really matter if it's ARH or x86. And so, honestly... It does say that Bolt supports ARH64 elf binaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so Mac OS, like if it, you know, they might not know about Mako binaries, might not know about whatever Windows uses, uh, and so that's probably why they don't support those. Uh, but yeah, I don't see why ARM wouldn't be supported. Um, I think we can move on to the the stabilized APIs. This time we talked about some of them, right? So the the byte operations on on pointers. One that stood out to me here is that the atomic types now have a from pointer constructor. So the setup here is that you know you have atomic U size. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, like atomic U size, atomic U64, atomic bool, etc. They now have a from pointer constructor, which takes a raw pointer, like a star mute U size for atomic U size, and they give you back an atomic U size. It's an Naturally, unsafe it's constructor. Unsafe. Well, it's a reference to atomic U size. Oh, yeah, it gives you a reference to an atomic U size. So it takes a star mute U size, it gives you back a reference to an atomic U size. And it's an unsafe function. The idea here is that if you have a raw pointer to something in memory, and you know that all of the other accessors of that memory, even, you know, they could be across FFI boundaries, for example, but you know that all of the ones who access it are using atomics, then you should be able to access them using atomics from Rust as well. And this is one of the ways in which you could do that. You could take this, this raw pointer that you have, turn it into a reference to an atomic use size so that you can then do atomic operations of it from Rust with the normal sort of atomic use size machinery. It does have a bunch of requirements though in the sort of uh, safety requirements for this unsafe block, including things like it needs to be valid as though it was an atomic use size. So that means it needs to be of at least the size of an atomic U size. It needs to be the alignment that an atomic U size requires. It needs to be valid as an atomic U size for the entirety of the lifetime that you ask for it for. So this includes things like for, I guess for atomic U size, all bit patterns are valid, question mark, but it cannot be accessed by non-atomic operations while you have an atomic U size reference to it, for instance. And so there's a bunch of requirements, but if you meet them, this is a good way for you to be able to do atomic operations on, on arbitrary memory, especially useful for things like FFI. Another set of things that were stabilized in 175 is um, some helper, both functions and types for setting and getting file times for files in the file system. So there's things like when it was last accessed, when it was last modified, um, both changing and reading that information out. You have been able to do this in sort of OS specific ways for a while, I think, but now there is sort of a, a standard cross OS way to do so, which just extends, you know, the, the amount of things you can do without something like a config Unix or config Windows, which I think is really nice. Do you have any insights, Ben, into why file times was sort of took this long before we got a, an OS independent version of it? I'm not quite sure. Um... Yeah, I don't know any in particular why file times would be uh, a hard thing. Again, it's one of those things where it might just be nobody needed, or maybe you know, maybe it was good enough for a, a long time that the OS specific ones were there, and you didn't like you know, no one really cared to ask for a uh, a generic. Uh, yeah, it could be you know, platform independent one. I also thought it was interesting that options now have an as slice method. So if you have an option T you can get back a slice of T that is of length zero or one, depending on whether the option is some or none. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> right? Like, I don't really know what this is useful for, but I, I guess it could be useful. Yeah, we definitely need to uh, have, like, you know, how C has the uh, obfuscated C competition or the underhanded C competition, right, too. Uh, and then we should have yeah. the, the most spe strangely specific, like, head-scratchingly, like, you know, who actually needs this? <laughs> API. I'm not saying it shouldn't exist. I'm just saying that like I have no use for this, but I mean it's interesting that it exists. The the best thing I can think of here is that you're trying to call something that requires a slice, like some API that requires a mm -hmm. slice, and all you have is an option. And in order to do that, you want to avoid the copy or the clone rather. So if you have an option and you want to call a slice API, then if the option is some, previously you would have to either clone the thing out of the option, put it in an array, and then give a reference to the array to the thing, which is obviously incurs a clone uh, unnecessarily, or you would have to write some unsafe code to transmute 
the reference into a slice reference, which is probably what this does under the hood, right? Option yeah, someone slice. Someone asked for it. Like, you know, it is it is rare. You know, again, things look done unless somebody asked for it and somebody wanted this. And so I'm really curious what their use case was. It's interesting too, because I'm looking at the implementation of the method now, and it's not as obvious as you would think. Like it uses slice from raw parts, but it has to be a little mm -hmm. bit careful to specifically get the offset of the field inside of the option. I think it tries very hard to never create a reference to the field inside the option directly. Mm -hmm. But again, not sure why. It's just, it's just interesting. Yeah, well, it's also, you know, funnily, it uses the byte add that also just got uh, stabilized. Stabilized, yeah, too. I saw that. Not that it needs to be stable because it's in a library, but I mean, it, it is funny that it, it, <laughs> it's just right there. So clearly it's good for something. Yep. In the change log, there are a couple of things I found. One of them is we now implement buff read for vecdeq, vecdq, vecdeq mm -hmm. uh, of U8. So buff read is the thing that gives you like dot lines and dot read until. Um, and it's the reason why often if you have something like a file or something, you wrap it in a buff reader, both often to improve performance, but also so that you get access to methods that work better if they have a buffer that they're reading into so that you can like read a bunch of stuff into the buffer and check whether certain properties hold in the buffer and then return a subset of the buffer to the user. So lines being a good example where if you do a read from a file, you might get multiple lines back, but the thing you want to yield from a call to, to sort of next line is just a subset of the stuff you got out of the kernel. And so that's where something like a buff reader comes in and buff read is the trait for things that can behave in that way. So that includes things like line and it used to be implemented for vec of U8 and now it's also implemented for vec deck of U8. And I think this is just one of those completeness things. Vectec U8s are handy because you can access them from both sides. So it's a useful way where you can sort of push by, you push bytes to the end or you can grab bytes from the beginning. Um, but I don't know that they're super widely used for like representing reading and writing bytes from a network or a file or something, usually in a, in a test kind of set, setting. Like I don't know that the, the ability to operate on the front of the thing matters that much there. But I guess finally someone actually came in and had a need for it. And so now it's in there. Oh, uh, actually, so I was uh, in the Reddit thread for this. And one of the top loaded comments was actually someone happy about option as slice. Uh, it has a 200 upvotes. So clearly uh, it was a great, uh, so uh, Logic, who's a, uh, one of the editors for this week in Rust for a long time, uh, has a, a long comment describing uh, what they like about this. So do you want to, I'll, I'll put the link there in the, the chat. And then, John, if you want to read it. Yeah, sure. I'll pull uh, it up. Go ahead and uh, see there the reasoning. Oh, yeah, here. I'm so happy about option as slice. Oh, I guess slice from pointer is the thing you could use in order to avoid the clone as well. Although I think that's, that is still unsafe. I see. So this is branch free as well. Okay, yeah, I guess I, I guess I can see that. So it, it's a safe way that avoids a clone and also avoids a branch. So it it's just a sort of very low overhead implementation of this pattern. I still don't know what it's useful for, but I like the uh, the addition. The other thing I had was, uh, and this is sort of a minor, minor little um, improvement, which is now if you run cargo new inside of a workspace, it will automatically add the new crate you created to the list of members in the workspace. That's nice. Will it also add the inherit workspace blind your cargo I don't tunnel? think so, no. But it will add the path to the members list. But okay. I think that's all it adds. At least if, if I if I look at the diff here, out cargo tomal members. No, it doesn't add anything to the new crate. It just modifies the cargo tomal of the workspace. And then another one I saw, and this one is, is pretty cool. I, I think you might have opinions on this one, Ben, which is now when you match on a U size, or I think in general, it's like U size and I size, then now you no longer get an error if your ranges are exhaustive because you have a half open range in both directions, for example, then mm -hmm. Rust now knows that your matching okay. is exhaustive. Very so cool. the example they give here is that if you have a match of a U size, and you have a single arm and it's zero dot dot, then Rust will be happy with your code. But if you write, for example, match over U size, you write zero dot dot U size max, it will complain that you didn't cover U size max. 
So it actually catches that that version is not exhaustive. Very cool. I don't know how smart it is. Like if I did an arm that's like a zero or an arm that's until four and an arm that's five and onwards, would it then still catch that it's exhaustive? Hmm. I guess it's it's easy to test. Try it right? out. Try it right now. Uh, let's see. Let's if I do a match on zero use size, and I do zero, I do one to five, and I do six onwards. Is it happy? It's happy. And if I do seven, what does it say? Not exhaustive pattern. Six is not covered. Nice. That's cool. I like that. And then this last one I saw, which I'm surprised got buried, but it's it's really neat. So Rust will now automatically enable cross crate inlining for small functions. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's interesting here is when you have, because Rust compiles every crate separately, when you have a function in one crate that calls a function from another crate, the function from the other crate does not get inlined into the caller unless that function specifically says, you know, uh, has the attribute inline. If it doesn't, then Rust will not inline it into the caller. But that changed in Rust 175. Now there's like a little bit more of a heuristic to decide when to actually allow an inline. And it goes beyond just it needs to have the attribute. And this matters a lot for, you know, smaller functions where the cost of calling them might actually dominate the cost of them executing. So inlining could have a huge advantage. Right. To, to dig a bit deeper there. So, right. So inlining is the thing that LVM uh, performs and it has like heuristics generally to say whether or not it should be inlined because then I can easily make your code slower if you do it wrong, um, right? And so uh, Rust, whenever it like you know tries to inline things, um, it doesn't necessarily have the code needed to inline a thing, but sometimes it does though. And so uh, in your case, to you know invalidate what you just said, right? If you have a generic function, um, it can inline those things uh, sometimes because in order to like you know monomorphize a generic function, it already has to encode the code required for the actual the body of the function, and then you're gonna uh, in the uh, an abstract way. Um, and so that information already exists. Um, and so normally the role of the inline attribute is to make that, that information exist like you had, like it was a generic function. Um, and then also inline always if you want to force it to be inline, which is often a bad idea. And you shouldn't do that. And this case just says, hey, like, we'll, you know, we don't need you to actually mark it as inline. Uh, we'll just automatically let me export the uh, metadata if you uh, have a small enough function, which I'm, not, I'm curious to know what small means, but maybe it's kind of just a, you know. Uh, yeah, it, kind of the, is good enough. the PR is pretty vague about what small means. I think what it specifically says is uh, we only infer inline ability for functions whose optimized mirror does not contain any calls or asserts. So it's functions okay, so that like don't make any other functions. function calls. Yeah. Uh, well, there's also separately, I mean, like, you know, you still don't want to, if you have a giant function, you still probably wouldn't want to inline that. And so there probably is some still some size constraint. Yeah, but I think it's interesting, right? Because how large of a function can you write where it doesn't call any other functions? Well, I, I know that. Um, so I mean, you could have like you know, a, a, I guess right. Is is math like are intrinsics like two plus two? Like you know, is that really a function call? It depends on how they define it, right? Yeah. But I think so. In, in Go, the language Go, they have their own heuristic where it's just like you know, if if you are one statement, and so it's like statement. Uh, oriented uh, and so again it's a heuristic and i think in like javascript right it's like the number of bytes that your function body is which includes like comments because it's javascript uh right and so like if you, had, you need to take comments out of your code if you want your code to be inlined more by the jit um that's the heuristic right and so it's all people guessing what might be good yeah i mean the the pr does say that the heuristic that's implemented in this first PR is deliberately conservative uh, and that the plan is to like adjust this over time as they come up with a better heuristic. But at least now there is a heuristic as opposed to mm -hmm. if your function isn't generic, you have to put the inline attribute there if you want it to be inlined. Mm -hmm. I think that's all I had for 175. Do you have anything else? Uh, so in cargo news, uh, ePage wanted to highlight that uh, it cargo. So, okay, here's a cool thing, PSA, right? So terminals, right, made in the 70s before there was an idea of what, you know, colors were. The world was all black and white back then. And at some point they realized, hey, colors are cool. Let's like you know, add these like weird little ANSI escape codes where now you can have like, you know, blue things in your terminal. Like, the background can be bright or whatever, right? Um, and so uh, there's like, there's so many of these. And one of the things you'd never think about is that there are, there, your terminal probably supports hyperlinks. 
Uh, and so if you like, you might need to like in your terminal, if you have, if you see a link, try like holding control and mousing over it and see if it like, you know, highlights it and like click on it and see if it actually opens it in your browser. Uh, and so for terminals that support it, um, Cargo is now emitting uh, the anti-escape codes to uh, hyperlink uh, various things. And so example is in, in, in the, if you run cargo build dash dash timings, it cr generates a graph of the like timings just to figure out oh, where's my compile time being spent uh, when I build this thing. Um, and it, it, it makes it as an HTML file, which you know is locally loaded by your, your computer. Um, and now uh, in certain browsers or in certain terminals, right, you can uh, open that like with hyperlink support and just click on it and open it immediately. And so it's kind of a, just a nice little quality of life thing. Yeah, that is really nice. I didn't even realize that you needed specific ANSI escape codes for this to work. I thought it was the terminal auto detection feature, like regex match on I mean, your output. Some terminals do. I imagine you probably could <laughs> in some terminals, but I think that, you know, uh, yeah. Well, it, so in this case, right, like, so the car, the output of cargo to build dash timings is not like a web address. There's no, there's no HTTPS, there's no protocol field. It's just, it looks like a path. And so mm. it's just a path that ends in .html. Oh, so I see, because it's, it's a know, local path, you know, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. By the way, try out right now. Go to your, your favorite crate and do cargo build dash timings and check out the output. It's like a, a lovely little uh, web app they've, they've made here. Very, very simple and clean. Uh, let's do dev miner. What do we have here? Let's do a tone. What am I doing? Cargo, cargo build dash dash timings. Build timings. No. It's not a link. Where's your terminal support. Not a my, link. My terminal does support Pro links, but... What uh, terminal you're using and what, like, you're using a Tmux or This anything? is Tmux in Alacrity. Yeah, they, they mentioned that Tmux does not currently support uh, these, and so it's probably turned off. Mm. But apparently Zezzage does, so. But I got my timing, though. Look at that. Look okay. at that timing graph. <laughs> 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 this crate has no dependencies. <laughs> its code gen was 0, 0.0 seconds. You might need to do a cargo clean first, because it might be saying, hey, like you, uh, you have everything is totally cached. <laughs> no, but it, like literally this crate has no dependencies. Okay. But I can find you one that does. This one does. Yeah, so here there are dependencies. Scale. Scale more. More? It might change the graph down below. Oh, yeah. But why is it so scrunched? Maybe you, you scaled it <laughs> because your scale tried to turn it back down. But if, if I scale it down, it's it's worse. It's more of a lot. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> I need to scale it more, but I can't scale it enough. Well, it's all HTML. Just like hack the control shift C That's and right. hack the code. <laughs> nice. All right. In that case, how about we move on to 176? There were no point releases for 175. No point releases this time. So we well, should move on to a quick break. And we should we also should, definitely. Ch check in on our PR. Right. Let's see the PR. The saga continues. Saga continues. Refresh just in case. Still only three hearts. Wow. Uh, this thread, I resolved it. Is people happy to resolve it? Yes, seems so. That's good. So now it's just waiting on CI. Okay. Is it all squashed and ready to, to merge when someone approves it? Yeah. I mean, there's only one commit. All right. I think there's hope. Uh, I think do you there's want to hope. Bring up the um the. Ooh, it's the got a it's got a queue? it's got a tada now. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, let me bring up Boris. Do I show off. I uh, think people haven't looked at the uh, the build bot. Oh, yeah, oh what is it? Homu dot no, queue. it's Boris dot rustlang dot org, and then search for string. This guy. Right, and so if you ever want to see um, what is currently being worked on in Rust CI, you can just come to this uh, this page, and see what's there, uh, what's currently been approved or is in the process of building, or what might, might roll up soon or merge or that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's a it's a great little page. It is at least mergeable. I'll take that. Uh, all right, then I'm gonna get some water and be back. All right, great break. break. 